Good morning, everyone. Well, uh, you can see two faces. Yes, one live, one uh, contemplative. Yes, I mean, of course, this is uh, Jeffrey Archer, and as you can see, it's clearly given the story that we are going to discuss today uh, is the Chinese statue. It looks nice. See, books. You have books lined behind Jeffrey Archer. You have books lined behind me. Yes, so it's sort of something matches yeah other than that i don't want anything to match with jeffrey archer yeah except for books um all right now lots of things little things have i've written about him and which you can read about in the text but what we are doing in this story the chinese statue is we are studying if you see the journey of a statue and the journey of a family so the journey of a statue which goes along with the journey of a family and uh, that is a main focus so we are going to do the story slightly differently i'm not going to read through but we are going to go through interesting sections about it and also to keep in mind what are the details that we really need to know so journey of a statue and journey of a family right okay we if we move on to the next slide uh, yes i mean of course it is a chinese statue so i i have just randomly picked up a statue which uh, which definitely is um, is antique and it definitely looks is chinese uh, and there is a deliberate reason why i left it incomplete because this was a ch statue that was uh, when it was selected did not have a base so the base was fitted in later so let's put a base to this so the base was fitted in later now um please uh, these are not the actual this is not the actual chinese statue or the the base this is just for you to get a mental picture you can draw your own base and you can draw your own statue but just to give you the key components of this story right so the base is important because we are going to this is a journey that that we are going to trace the journey of this statue and the base is also important because uh, it was casually added to make the statue a, a whole but at the end of it uh, do we keep to the casual approach about the base that is what we are going to discover right okay so the key components and when the story opens we are at a auction house which is sotheby's auction house a famous auction house um that's the opening scene and lot number 103 please remember lot number 103 so these and so these and there there uh, the story opens when we get to see the ming statue of the base and ready for auction lot number 103 how did it end up there how did it end up here a chinese statue that is the journey that is the story that we shall discuss ah i didn't put a face because i don't know how uh, even in my imagination i could not conjure a face for alexander heathcote so i just put a i just put the the costume of the knight commander of the royal victorian order you know that he did receive sir so alexander heathcote did receive the title of the k cvo the knight commander of the royal victorian order so uh, service to his queen foreign office at whitehall third secretary in calcutta yes second secretary in vienna first secretary in rome and as he as he sort of um, um, grew in stature deputy ambassador in washington and finally ambassador in china during 1871 he is the one to come across the statue and pass it on as a family heirloom so the story begins from how alexander heathcote came in possession of the statue yes uh he was an exact man i would ask you to look at page 60 first paragraph where you you are told why he is exact because everything about him was done by to perfection and he did everything according to how things should be planned a very exact man and that's if you see the way he rose 
to becoming the ambassador was also very exact. He didn't break rules or uh, he sort of did not uh, overtake anybody for a, a position. He, he, he went on uh, to become, reach the position, uh, very fair and very organized manner. So an exact man, right? So page 60, first paragraph, please mark it out. And on page 67, the third paragraph, you have instances to show that he was an exact man, right? Okay, that's Sir Alexander Heathcote, who actually is the main, you can say, the protagonist or the main perpetrator of getting the Ming statue from where it was to where it finally lands. Like I said, lot number 103, so please. Maybe not directly, but let's trace the story. So that's Alexander Heathcote for you. Then when you move down, you come to this little quaint village, foothills, yes? Ancient Chinese village called Ha Li Chuan. Yes, I'm not very good with Chinese pronunciation. I pronounce it the way I see it, okay? The craftsman was Yang Li. I didn't, I didn't uh, venture into creating the face of a Chinese craftsman. Leave it to your imagination. You all are good with it. So the craftsman is Yang Li and he belonged to a trusted family who had been craftsmen for 500 years. Okay, so the craftsman is Yang Li. Trusted family, very important this word trusted family. They are known for their trust. They are known for what they, uh, this kind of artwork that they have created and sold and they are connoisseurs of art, especially Ming, because Alexander Heathcote prided himself to be uh, uh, absolute all knowledge uh, about Ming uh, sculpture, right? So Sir Alexander asked for the Ming statue and it was gifted to him. How I wish the piece was mine. I have written these key words here because Chinese tradition of gifting, uh, what an honored guest request. Yes, so this is a Chinese tradition of gifting what an honored guest request. So, uh, Yang Li received a marvelous gift in return. So, the way the story unfolded, of course, uh, in Sotheby's, that's where we see, but then it is a flashback of how the story came into the possession of Sir Alexander Heathcote. And when he, he came into the court of, um, in Peking, that time Peking, now Beijing, he was the ambassador. So as an ambassador, he had the opportunity to visit, uh, visit numerous places. So one of the places that he visited, and it's because he loved art, he loved Ming, uh, the knowledge of Ming, um, the Ming dynasty was something that he prided himself upon. So he decided to visit this, uh, the craftsman Yang Li and there he saw the piece. And the minute he asked, say, how, how I wish the piece was mine, that's a Chinese tradition. Uh, he, he was gifted that piece. Uh, and uh, as a matter of fact, because the piece did not have a base, Yang Li put the base onto it and uh, gifted it to him. And uh, but Sir Alexander Heathcote was what kind of a man? Yes, he was an exact man. He just won't take a gift without not giving anything in return, right? So what he did was he immediately sent a telegram back to his bankers in his home, London, and he got money from his savings and he decided, and he realized, you know, he, he had a Mandarin for company who would help in translating uh, uh, you know, the speeches, uh, he didn't know Chinese and Yang Li didn't know English. So the Mandarin helped in communication. So from the Mandarin, he realized that they do belong to a very poor family. They are hard up. And uh, so Sir Alexander Heathcote decided, all right, in return, I shall do justice. And he went and built a beautiful house for Yang Li. Now, I haven't got that house. But I got some key features of the house. It was a white house. Please don't mind the railings. The railings look very modern. But what's important is it had two stone lion dogs guarding the entrance, which is supposed to be very 
and a lucky a lucky charm for the Chinese. So I I got these two white stone lion dogs, you know, like guarding. And this was at the entrance, which was gifted by Sir Alexander to Yang Li. And he had used a large portion of his savings to build the small white house. Yes, um, a small inadequate gift and my feeble attempt to repay in kind. That's what he says. That was his attempt to repay in kind. So he gives him the White House in return. And that, this ends the first part of the story, how the statue traveled from belonging to a little a craftsman shop in a small village, a Chinese village of Peking, uh, foothills to moving to the hands of Sir Alexander Heathcote along with the base that was just put in casually because a statue cannot come without a base and then so now the question arises how did it reach uh, the auction house right if but this is remember only the first part of the journey we are going to do the second part of the journey which is how it opens out, right? The next. So we begin with Sir Alexander Heathcote, who got the statue, right? After he served his term in Peking, he came back to his hometown, Yorkshire. Yes, he retired to Yorkshire. And the little Ming emperor found a pride of place. You know, he had a mantelpiece and he put it up there. Uh, pride of place and people used to come and admire and talk about it and he used to narrate the story of how he came about chanced upon, upon this statue and it, it had become his the Ming Emperor Kung was bequeathed to his firstborn so he, he was an exact man so he left a will and in that will he said the firstborn would receive the Emperor Kung the Ming statue, right? And and it had to be followed in the same manner, right? Sorry for this. And it had to be followed in the same manner, gifted to the firstborn, right? Gifted to the firstborn, right? It passes on. His firstborn was Mary, Major James Heathcote. Now you see, we are talking about the journey. I told you the first part of the journey is over. Now begins the second part of the journey when Emperor Kung or the Ming statue travels from one generation of the Heath court to another. The second one, first his first one was Major James Heath court. He was a part of Duke of Wellington's regiment, right? So he loaned the statue. He said, now what will I do? You know, it's such a beautiful statue. Why not everybody admire it? So he loaned the statue to the regimental mess at Halifax. So at Halifax, you know, the town of Halifax, he loaned it to the regiment and it stayed there at the statue at the regiment at quarters and people used to come and admire it. Then he became the colonel of the dukes in 1855. Another, he moved, yes. So he kept the statue along with his war trophies. As he was the colonel of the dukes, he moved to another regiment. He kept the statue along with his war trophies and display, right. So how the statue travels. On his retirement, he went to his ancestral home in Yorkshire and the statue, sorry, there should be and there, the D is missing, a typing error. The statue went back to the drawing room mantelpiece. So similar to what was done by his father, it finally reached the mantelpiece. You see how the, how the Ming statue, how Emperor Kung is traveling, right? After his death, it passes on to his firstborn, which is Reverend Alexander Heathcote. You know, it's a tradition in the West that you name your son after your father. So we look at, so I've named the first one, Sir Alexander Heathcote, the, the father of Major James Heathcote, and the son is Reverend Alexander Heathcote, to distinguish. He was a parish priest at Hertfordshire. So he was a parish, parish priest there, and the Ming statue was on the mantelpiece of the vicarage. So he kept it in the mantelpiece of the vicarage. And people from his parish used to come and admire the statue. So you see, the statue is moving, traveling, different districts of England. Okay? 
then he was promoted to the right reverend you know like bishop of his uh, district town locality whatever in those days and the statue went into the bishop's palace so it occupied the position there in the bishop's palace till he passed away yes so when he passed away uh, we move to the next slide uh, give me a second yes uh it passed on and when he passed away he s gave the ming statue to his first one which is again captain james heathcote so in between you have one who is not in the regiment that was reverend alexander heathcote you go back to captain james heathcote again remember the father and son the names so just be careful about that yes this was major james heathcote the father of alexander heathcote goes on to captain james heathcote the son so sir alexander heathcote yes major james heathcote reverend alexander heathcote captain james heathcote yes so went back to his first born same regiment as his grandfather shared his name as well okay so what happened to emperor kung returned to the mess table at halifax so you see emperor kung is visiting revisiting the places that he has traveled in the past right the regiment was at war with germany uh first world war is over because the captain james heathcote was killed on the beaches of dunkirk yes. so what happens there uh the ming according to the english law that upheld that the great grandfather's wishes passed on to his 2 year old son yes. so the 2 year old son at that point in time when his father died was bequeathed according to his great grandfather's wishes the emperor kung now when it comes to the son if you see there are no titles attached to this alex it's same name as alexander but i'm going to give it uh, a very uh, common name i'm not even calling him alexander i'm calling him alex heathcote that's how jeffrey archer has mentioned it he's a commoner does not belong to the army nor to the religious order he's a commoner common man like you and me so alex heathcote but he was a very different kind of a person he grew up to be a spoiled selfish brat unlike his ancestors grew up to be a gambler wow all the traits that we have not found uh, very modern modern traits but not found in any of his um uh, uh, predecessors kept playing roulette and losing money each time he thought that he is going to find out a new way of winning he kept losing 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 so what happens to gamblers who are addicted to gambling you tend to build up something you lose money but what do you build up you build up a debt because you keep taking loans and you fall into the prey of loan sharks right so he kept losing money but how did he console himself he consoled himself with the thought that he had the ming emperor remember also i just want to mention it to you that uh, in the will sir alexander heathcote had written that it should pass on to the first born unless the honor of the heathcote family was at stake so if the honor of the heathcote family was at stake then whoever had the statue then could recourse to selling it and up holding the honor of the family so nobody else thought about it because everyone was well settled well established except for alex heathcote spoiled brat gambler that he was so he kept losing kept borrowing back of his mind okay i have the ming emperor when it came time for repayment and the ming went to sotheby's for auction he was in for a shock as he was informed that the ming was a fake and worth only 
to 800 pounds. The Ming was a fake. At this point in time, I'm going to ask you to think. Go back to where it started. Do you think the craftsman Yang Li, who belonged to a trusted family of 500 years, really know that it was a fake? First question. Second question. Sir Alexander Heathcote, who prided himself for having an absolute, um, you know, sort of uh, in-depth knowledge about Ming culture and art, and uh, was he duped as well? He couldn't decipher whether it was uh, true or not. So, was it so like the original that difficult even for a for an absolute critic to even decipher the deception yes uh only 700 to 800 pounds so what do you think alex what happened to alex he gave up he said go on i'm now going to prison lead me on to the gallows yeah, I'm going to the prison. Yes. But the twist in the tale follows. And if you look into the last slide here, right here, the base, the insignificant base that Yang Li just put in. He just went into his workshop room inside, took out a base, and he said, well, I can't give you a statue without a base. He just attached the base to it. The base was a magnificent 15th century work of art. Lot number 103. The base was sold for 22,000 guineas. I did a lot of calculation. I used the present British pounds. So roughly approximately Indian rupee, it would be 20 lakh 35,964.24 approximately. Now, I've used according to 20th of May 1920 guinea to a British pound, British pound to Indian rupee, that kind of conversion, an approximate figure. But good enough to pay back his debt. Remember, we are not talking of 2020. We are talking out of for time, the early part of the uh, maybe the 20th century. Yes, so a uh, priceless uh, uh, amount which is unthinkable, right? So the twist in the tale is the base, yes. So have you understood the story? Have you understood the journey? And that's why at the end, that's why I wrote lot number 103 because that's how we began, if you remember. The first slide, um, not uh, not ex exactly the first slide, but Jeffrey Archer followed by the Sotheby's where the auction is taking place and lot number 103, the journey of Emperor Kung and the Ming statue. I did it through pictures and through the PowerPoint. Right, so we, we sort of move on now to the questions that follow. Yes, I put it all into this slide as well. Uh, so let's look at it. Question one. See, when you when it flows, it's very easy to do the questions together. Easy for you to remember. First question. The Chinese statue by Jeffrey Archer traces the journey of a priceless piece of art. Sorry, folks, there shouldn't be a question mark. I'm sorry for that. With details from the text, justify the above statement. 20 marks. Yes. Traces the journey of a priceless work, piece of art. Uh, yes. Justify the above statement. So, you are going to trace the journey of the priceless piece of art. You could either begin on what you think was the priceless piece of art, whether it was the statue or the base. You could set the notion of the opening statement. Perhaps the question, uh, the question mark is not too wrong. You, but you could set the you could set the uh, question. Uh, uh, sorry, what is this now? 
moving to the end okay leave it um uh, you could unwrap the question in the very beginning and talk about the statue not being priceless what what is what is priceless is the uh the base and then talk about how it came about and then how it reaches the auction house where we get to know the actual price so it is the journey of the statue right in brief remember avoid doing a summary of the story you can start from the end and go to the beginning question 2 an exact man was proved wrong in his judgment when it came to emperor kung and pen qiu discuss the different layers in the above statement in context of the chinese statue by jeffrey arch an exact man was proved wrong in his judgment who was the exact man sir alexander he put how was he proved wrong what were the circumstances talk about how he came chanced upon the statue how the statue became his how he it found a, posi- a position of the greatest pride in his household how he bequeathed it to his um, to his um, for son and that is how it passed on till 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 it reaches the auction house and he's proved wrong in his judgment of judgment of the value of the statue but he was also proved wrong because he undervalued or perhaps paid no heed to the base so was he really such a fine did he have such a fine eye for art that is the question you could end your answer with was he really the connoisseur of art as he thought himself to be he loved art but loving art and understanding art is different right so different approach but again the journey of the statue question 3 i've done it in three parts how i wish the piece was mine this i feel is the is a wonderful um uh is one of the most uh, loaded uh sentences in the story in the context of the above line narrate the manner in which the piece become oh sorry for the typing piece become piece became his no it's fine in the context of the above line narrate the manner in which the piece became his yes the mine and his sir alexander heathcote how it became his so the first part of the story second the journey of the piece through the generation of the heathcote the journey of the piece through the generation of the heathcotes right that's what you write so as it passes from father to the first born remember the sir the reverend the captain the major to alex remember the way it follows sir alexander major reverend captain alex remember it kind of a sequence you will never go wrong right c the worth of the piece and the final revelation the worth of the piece and the final revelation you're moving to the details so when you're talking about alex in b just keep it to when it reaches alex you're not touching about how it reaches the auction house be very mindful about that so when you're coming to see the worth of the piece also you come go back to when sir alexander he could got it from young lee and then moving to the final revelation when you know, the auctioneers at uh, when uh, they had to when you put up put something up for auction you have to um, uh, see the value of it so how they judge the value and the realization also give your opinion about whether you believe this to be a deliberate act of deception or one of genuine lack of knowledge about the piece so a little point that little paragraph for as a conclusion whether you believe it to be a deliberate act of deception or a genuine lack of knowledge about the piece so the clues are in the story if you believe it to be act of deception look for clues in this story i challenge you to look for it if you find share it with me we will justify your answer but genuine lack of knowledge i have already given you the clues in the story you need to use it to justify your answer yeah so 
lesson done i hope you enjoyed this presentation i i enjoyed doing this uh, with you all in this manner do send me your feedback and go through this lesson once again go through the presentation take up your text as you go through it and you will be ready to write an answer good take care god bless see you soon